and we're here to talk about love. You know, we like to talk about love. And, and it's not just the love boat kind of love that we're talking about today. We are talking about 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And although it applies to love, marriage, love, 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 um, Paul was writing to the church. And he was writing to people like you and me who were just not quite getting along. Like we do sometimes with people that we love. He, we, there were some differences of opinion politically and they were just kind of rubbing up against his shoulders, uh, each other's shoulders like we do sometime with people that we love. So he wrote us this amazing guide to love that is full of great stuff that we're gonna share this morning. You know, sometimes love is not easy, right? We rub up against, you know, the people that we live with, the people you left at home. Uh, and sometimes you might feel like Linus. If I could just keep them all at a safe distance. You know, he was told to love people. And he said, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. Because sometimes people are just so people. We're just so human. The fact of the matter is every single woman in this room right here is weird. Can we just admit it? All of us. Everybody is somebody else's weirdo. <laughs> and you know, that's just the body of Christ. That's the human race. And Paul steps in and says, let me give you some words of wisdom and how to love on these people who are all so weird. Right? And there is great stuff in here. Jesus, he told us, you know, if you only love those who are easy to love, what benefit is that to you? That's not hard, but he says to love your enemies and pray for those who make life really difficult for you. This is not an option. He doesn't say, you know, love most people and you can go ahead and hate the other ones. He doesn't say that. He says, love your enemy and let me show you how it's done. Um, you know, without love, it says in 1 Corinthians, we're going to be jumping all over this passage all this morning, but at the beginning, it basically says, you know, without love, you might as either well be mute or just sound like this noise, this clanging, bashing, annoying truck, trash day noise that just, you can't hear anything beyond if there's not love accompanied by what you're saying. We have a God of love, and this passage reminds us that love is not just what you say, it's actions. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, it's all about actions. There are 15 verbs in 1 Corinthians 13. 15 verbs, it's do, do. It's love is an action verb. Paul doesn't even mention emotions here. He's kind of talking about obedience and stepping out in love. 1 Corinthians 13, seven is the verse that I chose. This is one of my favorite ones in the passage. And it says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And since everybody out there has probably got a different version of the Bible in your lap, some other versions say, love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. I like that. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It's ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and it endures everything without weakening. Love does and does and does and does. And I wanna take a minute to affirm you for the love that you do. Because I know in this room, there are people who are very busy loving on other people. And you might be in here bedraggled and tired because you need a break from these people you're so busy loving. For some of you, it's little mouths to feed and butts to wipe and endless disgusting chores and no sleep and all that. And I'm so happy that you're here today. For some of you, your love field is your coworkers. Some of them who you really like, some of them who you're just glad it's Saturday. <laughs> right? Some of you, your love muscle is being tested by teens at home who snarl just because you're standing there. What did I do? What, how, why am I so stupid? You know, some of you are loving on elderly parents and it's difficult and draining and exhausting. Your hands are busy. Some of you have children with special needs. Some of you love on a classroom full of little people who have needs and their parents who have needs. 
right? You are busy, and I know you. And a lot of times, love says I love you without saying a word, right? My mom is like this. I grew up, my mom's not saved yet, yet. And uh, we didn't grow up in a house of faith at all. I heard God's, use, God's name used around the house quite a bit, but it was not the way I like to use his name. But my mom is an amazing mom. And she says, I love you all the time with her hands. She wasn't one of those kinds of moms who would just like scoop me into her big double Ds, which I also didn't inherit from her, and say, ooh, I love you. You know, she just wasn't one of those mush pots like that. She was more the pat on the head, there you go, let me show you how to do this, here's how we make a square corner. You know, she'd make the lunch, she'd drive us everywhere, she sewed, she sewed. Does anybody really sew anymore? I mean, I don't, I've done a pillow. And she actually sewed the badges on our, on our brownie sashes, and I've tried to glue gun those things on, and that doesn't work. <laughs> They pop off, and... You know, but my mom was just that mom who was always there, And I realized once I became a mom, how much my mom rocks. It bothered me a little that she wasn't very emotional, but then I realized, okay, her hands said I love you all. This is hard. I realized how hard this was and what a rock my mom was. I want to show you a picture of my mom's hands. Did you ever look down at your own hands and say, I know these hands. They're my mom's. Mine are starting to look just like that. And you know, my mom hates her hands. She says, oh, they're so veiny and knuckly, and I don't, ooh. And I take her hands and I say, Mom, I love your hands. Because they say, I love you. And I hope I can do the same with my family. And I know you have been doing the same all week. So I just want to affirm you that, you know, a lot of that stuff you do day in and day out that says I love you without a word, you know who notices it? is Jesus. Because when we love on the least of these, it's as if we're loving him. So even now he says, thank you, thank you. Well, this song was about my mom's hands, but it's obviously about yours too. A breath ago, the day was new, filled with many things to do, a shoe to tie, a toy to fix, a tear to dry, a cheek to kiss. And I remember you reading little nursery rhymes, a favorite book a thousand times, a plate of love and food to grow and some kisses you would throw. And I remember you and your hands silently they love me hands of grace and strength for life your hands silently they guided me more than all the stars out there are the ways you've shown me that you care and I remember you there wearily I say good night and there beneath the kitchen light is the endless work undone I guess I'll be waking with the sun And now as I've grown I realize The tireless hours of sacrifice An image of your love for me I pray that I can be I pray that I can be Like your hand Silently they loved me Hands of grace and strength for life Your hands Silently they guided me More than all the stars out there 
are the ways you show me that you care and I'll remember you I'll remember you I'll remember you Well, I, I see some tears, and I know there's all kinds of mom stories out there. Some who, you know, you had a great mom, maybe you're missing her, maybe she has passed away. Maybe some of you, you know, are feeling like, man, I got gypped. And some of you might be the mom who's sitting there going, well, there's no way anyone will ever write that song about me. <laughs> but you know, our God is a God of new beginnings, right? Every day is new. His mercies are new every morning. Praise the Lord. He gave us morning. I'm so glad he didn't make it just one long string of life. I'm so glad I get to go to bed at night and start up in the morning and say, thank you, Lord. This is the day that you've made, and I'm going to start fresh. The first, song I, first time I played that song for my mom, though, her reaction was, <laughs> I don't deserve that song. Because she remembers all her failures. Well, not all of them, but she remembers a lot of the things that she did that she would love to do again, just as I do. But as her daughter, I don't remember the bad stuff about my mom. I just remember the good stuff. I'm not banking on it being the same way with my daughters. Just <laughs> Selective memory. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love bears all things. Let's look at that for a second. The Greek word that this comes from, you know, you think, oh, I can't bear it any longer, but actually the word is more a word that means to cover up something, to protect, like a roof in a heavy rain. And we are called to protect the people that we love. You know, um, love covers a multitude of sins is the way that it's said in 1 Peter 4.18 means building someone up rather than tearing them down. Protecting somebody's reputation all the time. Bears all things. We've got to remember that word all is in there for a reason. We are to protect the people that we love with our words in and out of their presence. I heard it said that people are quick to believe the bad things about good people. It's kind of sad. So I love how Spurgeon said that love stands in the presence of a fault with a finger on her lip. That's really good advice, isn't it? Especially for us women who, it can be a little hard sometimes, especially if you're from a family that the DNA is just to kind of talk about stuff and people or share a little bit too much. And we women, you know, we just find ourselves being a little loose-lipped sometimes. And if really, love bears all things all the time with patience, which also goes along with forbearance, which is connected here. Love also believes all things. This gives the person the benefit of the doubt, always trusts, innocent before proven guilty, you know, always believes the best in a person. Um, by the way, this does not mean uh, believing blindly in someone who has proven to be not trustworthy and dangerous, right? Let's just get that straight, that some relationships need healthy boundaries. But love believes all things really does mean that we believe God sees something good in that person. We can't always see it, but God does. And we can trust that God sees something and trust God to know. Speaking these words of belief into people is so powerful, right? You know, you know if you tell a kid, you can hit that ball, I, you can do it. Or you're really smart. That kid is going to feel like they can hit that ball and like they're really smart. Our words have so much power in them. And when we believe in them, and this isn't, you know, dumb belief, like, you're going to win that lottery, I just believe it. You can lead people into a lot of debt that way. Or a really uncoordinated kid, you're going to get into the Olympics, I just believe it. You know, it's not that, right? It is believing truth. 
And sometimes this takes time, and love takes time, right? Getting to know somebody so well that you say, you are creative. You are loyal. You are diligent, aren't you? And speaking those things into the people that we love. Love believes all things. Have you ever watched that show, The Dog Whisperer? How many of you have dogs out there? I'm just kind of curious. My friends, my friends. I have a dog, and he's an adopted dog, and he's a mess. You know, it's, it's really kind of a crapshoot when you get a dog from the pound. You never know what you're getting, and sometimes they're great, and sometimes they're... Well, he, he is trainable, but uh, this, this show, The Dog Whisperer, Sometimes they hit this Cesar Milan has these dogs on there that you just think, oh my gosh. And this recent show had this little a darling looking cocker spaniel that was just snarling and snapping and lashing out. And I thought, oh, I would have gotten rid of that dog in a day. It was just a scary little dog because it looked so cute. And that... <laughs> I was like, wow. So they bring Cesar Milan in and the guy within five minutes has that dog just sitting there. Calmly, and the parents are just, how are you doing this? And I realize it's because he knows dogs. He's like a dog psychologist. They call him the dog whisperer. He really does know fears and psyches of dogs. And he knows how to love it out of them and control it out of them. And he says that no dog is a lost cause, even mine. How much more does God know? Us. He's the man whisperer. The human whisperer. He knows why we're so weird. He knows why we do the things we do. He knows our past. He knows our fears and our burdens. He's right there. And so believing that God looks inside each one of you and says, I love you. I have plans for you. And I can work with this stuff really well. You just give it to me. That's believing in all things, believing God can work this out for good because that's the kind of God that we serve. Love never gives up on people. It's never a lost cause. Love also hopes all things. I love this one. This is probably my favorite word of the four. Love hopes all things. In another pastor's words, love refuses to take failure as final. You know, failure can be a very beautiful thing. I read a book a long time ago called The Failure, The Back Door to Success. And I went, that's me! Because I feel like even when I was a kid growing up and, and back when I took tests, a lot of it was, was uh, multiple choice. I think that's why I got decent grades. I can't remember anything. But I can pick a bubble out of three. <laughs> you know, but um, when I would get a question, a question wrong, if, if you go back over the quiz, you go, man, shoot! And I'm probably not going to get that question wrong again because you learn through failure. I've learned through a lot of failure. And we don't always have to look at it as such a bad thing, right? James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it joy, my beloved, when you encounter various trials, for the, the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you be complete, lacking in nothing. The trials complete us. So even though our knee-jerk reaction isn't going to be, yay, when something hard comes along or we fall on our face, we can say, okay, God, you're going to do something in that unseen realm of eternity that you can see and I can't. I, I have joy knowing that you're going to turn this into something good because he always does. He completes us, he reveals us, and he refines us through those trials and those failures. You know, I really had the delusional thinking that I was going to be a fantastic mom just by osmosis because my mom was an amazing mom, you know? And then I met myself, you know? I, I had this image of myself. I was going to be a mom who kept my, my, uh, my house clean, my car clean, forget it. You know, I was going to be a mom who was the fun mom who took my kids to the beach and played in the water with them. Not one of those boring moms who sits on the sand and talks to the other moms. And then I became a mom and I realized how fun it was to sit on the sand and talk with the other moms. <laughs> like, go play, go play, you know. I was going to be a mom who, like, painted with my kids in the house and let them cook. And then I started trying that with a toddler and a three-year-old and thought, oh, they'll do that in preschool. 
You know, I was going to be a mom. I don't know if this is you, but I was going to be a mom who never yelled at my kids. Because I saw that before I had children. And I would just be so pious. I, I'd look at that and go, oh, that woman is out of control. <laughs> She just needs to take a class or something. <laughs> I'm not going to behave that way. My children are not going to behave that way. And then I had four kids. <laughs> and I was introduced to a side of Jenna <laughs> that I didn't even know was under there. You know, it's hard enough if you just have people you've got to keep alive, right? It's just stressful. But then throw in a strong-willed kid. I had two little blondies that were just, you know, they were, yeah, they were okay. And then Brittany, my third, she came out of the womb with guns loaded. Her favorite word was no. I will not eat that. I will not wear that. You will not put that in my hair. No, no, no. I will scream when you try to put medicine in my mouth. There I am, sitting on this kid. You will drink this medicine. It was 50 bucks. <laughs> this kid wore me out. Do we have any parents of strong-willed children out there? Oh, the weary ones, right? And you just think, why can't you just say yes ever? Or okay. I'll tell you what, I was introduced to a side of me that I was not very proud of again and again and again, and I felt like a failure. And I would compare myself to other moms who seemed to have it all together, and their children were well-dressed and had braids in their hair, and, you know, they'd show up at these little things, and these kids were just walking beside them, and mine are, like, wild and running around. They're going to look back at their pictures and say, Mom, we look like little homeless children. <laughs> I'm going to say, I tried. I really tried. But eventually, you just get worn out. Right? I just was not happy with me a lot of times. But how beautiful is the friend who comes alongside you and says, I know, I'm just the same. I lost it with my kid the other day too. What are we going to do? And they will pray with you. And they will believe in you. <clears throat> that we are all growing as moms and as grandmas and as teachers and as moms. We are all growing. We never stop growing. We never stop growing, right? It's this journey that we're on. You know, I learned with that really super hard, will, uh, strong-willed little girl. Her name was Brittany. She is now 21. And I used to just think, God, can you please just make her stop? Change her personality. This is just really hard. And now that she's 21, I, I go, ooh, shame on me. Because Brittany, who had all that passion, is now Brittany with all this passion. She walks in the room, and the party starts. She loves everybody so much. And I think, wow, Lord, you know what? I just need to remember that you see something different. Help me see what you see. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him or her ask of God who gives generously and without finding fault. I love that. And you know what are beautiful words that we can give to our family? I'm sorry. I was wrong. What a beautiful gift that is to give to the members of our family, right? I'm sorry, I was wrong. You know, I love a friend who will sit with me and say, all right, sister, here we go. God is at work, Romans 8, 28. Faithful and truly loving is the one who can see that God works in situations and he sees the beauty in a mess. You know, God can take a mess and turn it into ministry. One of the ugliest messes I ever got myself into started when I was 16 years old and I was on the gymnastics team. <clears throat> Excuse me. And everybody on the gymnastics team was just super thin and I wasn't and they said, okay, here's how we stay thin. We eat and then we uneat if you know what I mean. And at first I was horrified, but then I thought, oh, okay, I'll try it. And it became a little habit through gymnastic season that lasted through high school and became this secret habit of mine that became an addiction that became bondage in my life. An ugly, defeating, disgusting, time-wasting addiction. You know, that kind of addiction, an addiction owns you, right? It owns your time, it owns your thoughts, and I was owned by that thing. It was the truth of Jesus Christ that finally set me free. 
the truth of the scriptures, that we do have an enemy who lies and lies and lies. And the truth of who we are in Jesus Christ, if we really believe it and abide in it, it will set us free. And I was sitting in this Bible study and boom, I just knew I was set free. And the Holy Spirit just started doing something really different in my life. Really different. I remember sharing that with one of my good friends. Like, that's not a pretty thing to share with a friend. That I had been struggling with this since I was 16. I was now 28. And I'll never forget, she didn't bat an eye. She was like, really? How cool that now God is going to use this as a ministry. Because she knew I wanted to share it with women. And as soon as I did, the doors started flinging open with other women with similar problems or the same problems. And we started to pray. And I watched God turn that mess into a ministry. Isn't that an awesome friend who loves you for who you are, who accepts you with all your junk? Nothing, nothing surprises me anymore. Nothing. Because we were hurting people. Another time when I watched my friends, oh, I want to share this verse with you that goes along with that. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen? I love that. I love those words. There was one other time when I, I don't think I was weaker than when I went through something I never thought I was going to go through. Um, I was married to a pastor, and uh, we lived the perfect life. We live in Irvine, safest town in the United States, I'm happy to report, just came out the other day. <laughs> and he was a pastor at a uh, church, college pastor, and we lived in this nice little house, and I had a daughter, and I had a golden retriever, very obedient golden retriever. We were making tapes. We were in a band. Tapes, remember? We were, in, we were in a worship team. Everything was just this picture of wonderful. And then this husband of mine, who everybody admired, including me, decided to peace out of the marriage. Just, you know, he was always a difficult guy to understand. But when I finally said, hey, you know, I don't feel very close. His answer was, I've never felt close. I've never loved you. I cannot do this. I've tried and I'm out. I was seven and a half months pregnant with our second daughter, and it was pretty much disaster. It was disaster to our church. It was disaster to those college students. It was scary. It was overwhelming. It was embarrassing when I found out that he had left with the secretary. And not only that, he'd had a full-blown affair with a close friend of mine for a long time. This pretty much took my tidy little world, shook it up and turned it upside down. Right? But God encloses gifts. He loves us so much that even in a messy, messy, messy time like that, he extends these gifts to us. And sometimes it takes a while to unwrap it, right? And go, oh, I needed this. And he extended to me the gift of fellowship with him in that dark place like I never knew before. It mattered to me, it mattered so much to me that I was his daughter because so much can change in who we think we are. Suddenly, all this stuff that I thought was me wasn't there. And I had to really wrestle with, who am I? I'm a daughter of the king. I am, the, I am a daughter of the king. He loves me. He's got a plan for me, and that will never change. And that's like all I needed. I would go and worship and just cry my eyes out, but then there was this joy of, thank you, God, I'm not alone. And my love for the word just became, you know, I was just clinging to the word. I love watching the sign language people down there and the girl did the sign for trust. I will trust you, Lord. I was hanging on to the word of God, breathing it in like water and like food. He was just doing so many great things in me, but I did see a side of me I didn't like so much. I was out of control. I said things that weren't nice. You know, I was mad. And yet my friends who really loved me, they were there. They were there to speak truth into my life and to hold me back when I needed to just start piping down, to remind me that I'm a daughter of the king and God's gonna somehow use this. And they're the ones who often wouldn't say anything. They just did things like help me move. I mean, is that not the definition of love? Can you help me move? 
You must love me. They were digging around under these, you know, long forgotten drawers and finding nasty stuff in there and, you know, just helping me move. And every time I would see these friends, I would think, God, what would I do without them? They helped me with their hands. They, we prayed together. We cried together. And we laughed together. In the middle of this crazy stuff, we'd find ourselves just busting out, drinking coffee, laughing. That is a gift from heaven. A true friend like that who really knows you ah, is a gift from heaven. And that's what I call this song I'm going to share with you called the Gift from Heaven, but I affectionately call this song the coffee song because I love coffee. And I think we do a lot of life over coffee, don't we? You know, I guess some of you drink tea and that's okay. Someday you'll grow up. <laughs> with you I've known the joy of laughing till we cry and even if we spend all day the hours always fly away there's no need for decorating all my words with you, my heart is free. An image of his tender love for me. We have gathered in the sunshine and we've chatted through the rain. Joy we've shared in answered prayer and we've worn each other's pain you're a gift to me from heaven a value without end oh the joy of knowing you my friend sharing deep convictions as we watch our children play countless cups of coffee i'm hearing half of what you say because my kids were always interrupting Took forever <laughs> the life is sometimes pain on pain or sometimes it's simply blue a tear a prayer the Lord is there between two. Oh, how rare and kind is one who seeks to find his loving hand, even as I fall. And how priceless and is each word you've given me to help me stand and to hear his call you're a gift to me from heaven a value without end oh the joy of knowing you the joy of knowing you the joy of knowing you my Yeah, that's a true friend, and I have a friend I think about a lot. She gave me this plaque once that says, in my father's house are many mansions. You know, from John 14. In my father's house are many mansions. I hope mine is right next door to yours. <laughs> Some of you crafty people out there, you need to make that. Because we all identify with that. There's just not enough time. I'm gonna meet a bunch of you here today and go, ooh, we could be coffee friends. <gasps> you know? 
sometimes I get to go and do concerts around the world and I meet people and I think, oh, I love you. I want to hang out with you and I have to say goodbye. But when we are sisters in Jesus, it's hasta luego. I'll see you later. I'll see you in heaven. And in heaven we have forever to look back and see all the great things that God did through the tragedies and the trials and the traumas and we will rejoice because he really does cause all things to work together for good. There was one last trial, failure, place I never wanted to go where, that I never would have made, made it a day without the love of the people around me. And that was, you know, I have two daughters from my first marriage. By the way, I have to make something very clear. One time I didn't clarify that, and I almost didn't just now. My husband is in the back, and one time I didn't clarify that, and he said, Jana, you didn't tell those ladies that I wasn't the guy. <laughs> I almost did that. No, he's not the guy. There's a handsome guy right back there. Wave your hand. That's my husband, Ron Alira. He was, bra Ron, wave your hand. <laughs> He was brave enough to marry a woman and two young kids, and we got married, and then we had Brittany as a little party. <laughs> and, another, and another little daughter. And he's just an incredible guy who produces all of our music, and he's just amazing. But a year into our marriage, a year and a half into our marriage, we had just started doing our, our children's music, and I was, we, we were on our way to do one of our first big concerts. And hopefully the worst thing that I ever go through happened. There could be more. We never know. But my little daughter, who was then just turned four, that was the last day of her life. Because we were involved in a car accident that just took her life like that. Just turned the wrong way, didn't see a set of red lights, looked down at a map at the wrong time, and boom, everything changed. No place any mom, anyone ever wants to go. And I always said I would go crazy if I ever had to say goodbye to one of my children. But because of Jesus Christ, it's not goodbye. It's hasta luego, right? Amen. She is in heaven. She is dancing. It is well. It is well with my soul. And I cannot wait to see her again. Not that I haven't cried a lot of tears, but I know my God keeps those in a bottle. And I know that in the meantime, he has used that tragedy in ways I couldn't, I could stand up here for five hours and tell you guys the stuff he has done through that tragedy where he has turned mourning to dancing and ashes into something beautiful. You know, I never thought I would be able to sing with kids again, and then he just started downloading these songs into my mind. Nothing, absolutely nothing will separate us from the love of God. That's true. You know, do you ever do that with scriptures? The word of God is living and active, and sometimes it just comes alive in you, like, I read that a hundred times. And, I, and now I get it. it. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So I wrote a song about it. And it's been sung all over the place. And sometimes when I see those little kids in other states, other countries, and they're singing that song, I imagine this little four-year-old girl in my cloud of witnesses saying, go, mom. Go, mom. You keep singing those songs because this is real. This is real. Even though you're getting a little old, just keep singing. God doesn't care. Just keep telling the truth, because it's true. Her, we live by faith, but she lives what I believe. She lives what I believe. And so ever since she went home to heaven, there's like this hook, this tether from my heart to heaven. I think about it all the time. And I love a friend who loves me enough to remind me of heaven all the time, that there's something bigger here, that there's forever there's eternity. This life is like five minutes. It's a blink. So help me to live my five minutes well, Lord, and to love those around me like you would love me. And love is beautiful. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and it endures all things. Right? It endures all things. That word is kind of like a military word that says... I am not giving up this battle. I'm going to be right here. There's a lot of fighting words in that word. And we need to extend that to the people that we love. I am not going anywhere because that's exactly what Jesus says to us. We could take Jesus' name 
and put it in all these, you know, today as we're looking at 1 Corinthians 13, let's put Jesus' name in place of love. Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes in you. Jesus hopes he has hope for you. Jesus believes in you. He knows the bigger picture. And that's why we give that kind of love to other people. He will do things that are a little bit unexpected because we can't do this alone, right? We can't love in our own flesh because sometimes it's just hard. I will never forget when the woman who was my friend walked in the door who'd had the affair with my husband. And it was a moment that I never expected it to go down like this. She just came in and she was flooding, you know, her tears were just running out down her face. And she says, can you forgive me? Because she was broken and truly sorry. And we fell in this pile of arms and tears on the floor. And I said, I forgive you. That's the power of Jesus. And I actually love that girl. Not that we're going to hang out or anything. <laughs> that could be a little weird. But I truly have love in my heart, big love. I have love in my heart for my ex-husband. As many question marks as I have, I am free. You know, Jesus says to forgive, and that's not an option either. But he says that so that we can be free as well. Because when we hold a grudge, it holds us. He will do it through us. I love that story of Corey Ten Boom, my hero who I can't wait to meet. I'm going to chase her down in heaven. Corey, there's going to be a long line behind her, but oh, Corey, please, I want to talk to you. Corey Ten Boom, who was a, uh, she was in a concentration camp. And when she got out, she tells the story that, you know, I mean, that's a living hell. We can't even imagine what they went through. And when she got out, she was preaching on forgiveness at a church in Germany. And then after she gets done, this man walks up and he says, Fräulein, and he sticks his hand out. He was one of the Nazi, whatever he was, sergeant, who had mocked her and made them walk naked in front of him and tortured them. And, and here he is standing in front of her with his hand out. Fräulein, isn't it great that the Lord forgives me too? And in her mind, she's going, I can't, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't love this man, I can't love this man. God can't love him. And out of obedience, she stuck her hand out. Just out. She said, okay, I'll just stick my hand out. And as she grabbed his hand, she said she felt this electricity go up through her arm and into her heart, and she loved that man. Because what we need to do is stick our hand out. God calls us to just go there, and he will do the loving through us. When we do not have it in and of ourselves, one of my favorite prayers that I share with young moms and, you know, myself is, God, make me love him. God, make me love her. Do it in me, because I can't do it myself, and I promise you he does it. Because he is love. He is love. Jesus is love. And when we really get that, we really get that we have these dark, ugly corners of our lives and Jesus walks right into them and says, I love you anyway. And we understand that he went to that cross with us in mind. And he loves us, he loves us, he loves us. When we really understand that grace, we can't help but say, okay, help me do the same. Help me, help me do the same. Because that's the two greatest commandments, right? Love God, love people. That's why we're here to love God and love people. Love endures all things. I love this little slide where Charlie Brown and, and Snoopy are sitting there and he says, if you ask me how long I'll be your friend, well, my answer will be, I don't know. Because I really don't know which is longer, forever or always. Right? We have a God who loves us, bears all things, believes all things, believes in us more than we can possibly understand. So, the truth of the matter is 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. What a great passage. We love because he first loved us. So today, let's think about it. Who are we having trouble with? Who is difficult for me to love? Maybe it's that ex-husband. Maybe it's that mother-in-law. Why does that always make people laugh? 
I love my mother-in-law, but I know there's some winners out there. Maybe it's that annoying neighbor. Just annoying. They're not terrible, they're just annoying. Maybe it's the family member who just loves to cut you down. Maybe it's the parent whose kid bullies your kid. You know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of hurt out there. Who is it that we're having a difficult time loving? Maybe it's even yourself. And you need to remember how Jesus loves you and wants you to say, let that go. I took it to the cross. Stop beating yourself up. And you know what? Life is this amazing journey of learning how to love. People who are politically opposite from you, people who look different than you, people who look just like you. It's this journey of learning how to love. I started that when I was 16, and I can honestly say I'm a little better at it now. That I've got some years and some wrinkles, a lot of wrinkles, and other things that remind me I'm on the downhill slide of life. But hopefully my heart is becoming more beautiful as I'm on this journey. Because that's what Jesus sees. And you know, it's not just a journey, it's a dance. And sometimes we just need to stop doing the leading and take Jesus by the hand and let him lead already. And lo and behold, when we do that, the dance becomes a little more fun. And we find ourselves becoming a little bit more like him day by day, by day. Day by day, I'm learning to love you. Day by day, I'm learning to serve you. You take my hand, you never walk away. As you change my heart, Jesus, day by day. I'm learning to love you day by day. I'm learning to serve you. You take my hand. You never walk away as you change my heart day by day. I'm learning to love you day by day. I'm learning to serve you day by day I love you Lord day by day you change my heart